Hello dear learners, I am Dr. Srutisrova Bhorali, Assistant Professor in the Department of Computer Science working at Krishnakanto Handikoi State Open University. And today, in this video lecture, I am going to talk about computer literacy. Now this module on computer literacy has been divided into two parts. In the first part, we will talk about computer literacy, digital marketing, teaching in the digital age, and the various methods of how to get access to the internet. Now let us look at what is the computer literacy. We must have heard this term a hundred times. So computer literacy is defined as the knowledge and the ability to use computers and related technology efficiently. Where the skill levels may range from the elementary use of computer to advanced levels. Now, computer literacy can also be referred to as the comfort level that someone has with computer programs and applications. Here, we must be distinguish the term computer literacy with computer programming. Now, computer programming is the coding of computer programs, whereas computer literacy is about how familiar one is with handling the computer and its various applications. Now, let us look at the different components of a computer. One must be familiar with the different components of computer and also use them in a, with a basic level of understanding to know how the components work. So there are mainly four components of a computer. So these are input devices, output devices, central processing unit and computer memory. So what are input devices? We can say that the input devices are the devices through which data or information is entered into the computer. Now let us look at some of the common input devices that we see and use in our daily life. So these are keyboard, mouse, joystick, scanner, microphone and barcode reader. Now let us look at each of these input devices one by one. So first of all, let us look at what is a keyboard. So the keyboard is one of the most commonly used input device and the keyboard is modeled after the typewriter keyboard. Now we have different kinds of keyboards. The QWERTY keyboards are the common keyboard layouts since they are modeled after the typewriter keyboards and these are very easy to use. We can also have different keyboards like numeric keyboards that only include the numeric keys. An example of this are the keyboards that we use in ATM transactions. Next, let us look at another input device that is commonly used which is the mouse. Now, the mouse is a handheld device which is used to control the position of the cursor on the computer screen. So generally, a mouse has three parts. It has two buttons on the left hand side and one on the right hand side and also one scroll bar in the middle. Here the mouse cannot be used to type text into the computer but the mouse is used to point and click on icons and functions and features that are very offered on the computer and it is also used to drag icons, files, folders from one location to another location into the computer screen. Now let us look at another device which is joystick. Now joystick is another input device which is similar to the mouse in the way that it helps to move the cursor position on the screen. A joystick also consists of a stick which is mounted on a base and the cursor on the screen moves as per the direction of the stick which is guided by the user. Now let us look at another input device which is commonly used which is the scanner. Now the scanner it takes a physical paper which may be handwritten or which may have printed text or which may be a photograph and then it converts this part into a digitized format. The output of the scanner can either be in the image format or it can be any other specific format, say like PDF format. Now let us look at another input device which is the microphone. 
Now, microphone is an input device that lets the user to enter audio as an input into the computer system. And this audio input is then stored into the computer's memory in a digitized form. Another input device which is commonly used and we can see commonly in our day-to-day -day life is the barcode reader. Now, what are these barcode readers? Barcode readers are input devices that take as input barcodes and they decode these barcodes and then they send the data to the computer. So, we can see these barcode readers commonly in shops and departmental stores nowadays. They are often used to make the processing of broad goods and items faster by processing the barcodes on the items and then sending the price information to the computer. These were all the input devices that we commonly see and use in our day-to-day -day life. Let us look at what are output devices. Now, output devices are the devices through which information is displayed or presented in some format from the computer. Some of the common output devices are monitor and printer. Now, let us look at these output devices one by one. So, the first output device is the monitor. So, the computer monitor is the most common output device that we use that displays the information in either pictorial or textual format. Now, the earlier monitors that were used were based on the technology of cathode ray tubes where the monitors were very bulky in size and they also consumed large amounts of power. The monitors that we use nowadays use liquid crystal display technology or LCD technology which has drastically reduced the size of the monitors and so the price is also reduced and so has the power consumption of these monitors. Now next let us look at another output device which is the printer. Now the printers are popular output devices that are used to take out print out of any document or image. Now the printers can be of different types. It can be a laser printer or it can be an inkjet printer. The laser printer uses laser lights to produce the dots that are needed to form the characters on the given page. The inkjet printer on the other hand sprays small droplets of ink onto the given page to form the characters. Now these were all the output devices. Next, let us look at the third component of a computer which is very important which is the central processing unit or the CPU. Now the CPU it is considered as the brain of the computer system. It is the electronic circuit that executes the commands and the instructions that are given in a program. Now the CPU it activates and controls the operations of all the other units and the resources which are with the computer system and it also performs the arithmetic and the logical operations in the computer system. Now the CPU has two parts. The first one is the arithmetic and logical unit or in short ALU and the second one is the control unit. Now the ALU is the functional part of the computer system that performs the arithmetic and logical bitwise operations. And the second part is the control unit. The control unit is a part of the computer system that interprets the instructions and then issues signals to other units of the computer system to execute them. Next. Let us look at the fourth component of a computer which is the computer memory. Now the computer memory is the storage space of the computer where the data and the instructions are all stored. We can often see that the term computer memory and the term computer storage are interchangeably used. But there is a basic difference between these two terms. The term memory is generally used to refer to fast and volatile technologies, whereas the term storage is used to refer to slower technologies. The computer memory can be divided into two categories, primary memory and secondary memory. Now what is primary memory? Primary memory 
holds the data and the instructions that the computer is currently using. And the data in this primary memory is directly accessible by the CPU. There are two main categories of the primary memory. One is the RAM and the second one is the ROM. Now we'll see the, these two primary categories of memories, RAM and ROM, in detail now. Now let us look at the RAM or the random access memory. So random access memory is a type of volatile memory and it loses the information when the computer is turned off. Now RAM chips can be categorized into two types, static RAM and dynamic RAM. Let us look at the difference between these two. The data in static RAMs are stored in transistors and hence they need a constant power flow. And since the power is constant, so the static RAMs do not need to be refreshed. Whereas the data in the dynamic RAMs are stored in capacitors. And since capacitors discharge energy, so there must be a periodic refresh of power in dynamic RAMs so that the data is not lost. Next, let us look at the ROM or read-only memory. Now ROM is a type of non-volatile memory where the data can be stored permanently. But once the data is written into a ROM chip, it can only be read. Hence the name read-only memory. However, we have now new categories of ROM like PROM, EEPROM, EEPROM, where the data can be erased and modified. PROM or programmable read-only memory allows users to program the ROM. In EEPROM or erasable programmable read-only memory, it is possible to erase the data by exposing the chip to ultraviolet uh, lights and then reprogramming it. In EEPROM or electrically erasable programmable read-only memory, it is possible to erase the contents of the chip by exposing it to electric signals and then reprogramming it. So these were the different types of primary memory. Next, let us look at secondary memory. Now, what is secondary memory? Secondary memory is also known as external memory and it is a type of non-volatile memory which does not lose the data when it is turned off. The CPU cannot access the data in the secondary memory directly, so the data here needs to be transferred to the primary memory wherever it is needed for processing by the CPU. Now the data in secondary memory is stored permanently and the secondary memory costs are much less when compared to the primary memory. Some of the commonly used secondary memory devices are flash memory, optical disk, magnetic disks, etc. Now these were the four main components of the computer system. Next, let us look at how we can get access to the internet. In today's world, it is important for a person to have knowledge about internet and how to use the internet. Only knowledge about the different components of the computer is not enough. Now being a computer literate, one must be able to use the internet to one's benefit. Now internet access is the method and ways in which individuals can connect to the internet or get their connection to the internet. Now let us look at some of the common ways in which we can get access to the internet. So the first one is mobile data. Nowadays, most persons either own or they have access to a cell phone or a smartphone. Mobile data gives access to the internet as long as that device which is the cell phone or the smartphone is connected to a cellular network. Accessing internet through mobile data is very easy and so this method is quite popular among both the rural and the urban people. Another way to get access to the internet is by using Wi-Fi hotspots. Hotspots use Wi-Fi technology which allows electronic devices like the smartphones, laptops, etc. to connect to the internet through a wireless connection. Wi-Fi hotspots are sites that offer internet access over a wireless local area network by way of a router that then connects to an internet service provider. 
these Wi-Fi hotspots can be either paid for or they can be freely accessible to the public. Now let us look at another way in which we can get access to the internet. Dial-up connections are another way by which we can get connect to the internet. In dial-up connections, the users are required to link their phone line to a computer to get access to the internet. Now these connections have the drawback of not permitting the users to make or receive calls through their phone while the internet is being used. These types of connections were very popular in the old days but are outdated nowadays. Now let us look at another way in which we can get access to the internet. So the next way is broadband. The term broadband is shorthand for broad bandwidth. Broadband are high speed internet connections that use multiple data channels to send large quantities of data and information. These connections are provided through cable or through telephone companies. Broadband internet connections such as DSL and cable are high bandwidth connections. Another way to get access to the internet is through digital subscriber line or through DSL. Digital subscriber line uses the existing two wire copper telephone line that is connected to a person's home so that the service is delivered at the same time as the landline telephone service. The advantage here is that the user can still make and receive calls while using the internet. Another way for getting access to the internet is by using cable. The cable internet connection is also a type of broadband access. In this technology, the users use a cable modem to access the internet over civil TV lines. This type of connections are very fast and hence they are chosen by many of the customers. So these were the different ways in which we can get access to the internet. Now let us look at the next topic that is digital marketing. Digital marketing can be defined as a component of marketing that uses the internet and online based digital technologies such as desktop computers, mobile phones and other digital media and platforms to promote products and services. The marketing involves promotion of the brand through not only email and messages but also by using social media platforms like YouTube, Facebook and Instagram. The digital marketing using internet provides a very good direct marketing connection between the seller and the consumer of the goods or the services. Digital marketing includes the use of one or more online channels and techniques to increase the brand awareness among the consumers. Digital media marketing campaign may use single or a combination of channels such as mobile advertisement, TV, online advertisement, SMS, etc. Marketing of the products through email is one of the most commonly used mechanism in digital marketing. From the last few years, marketing through advertisement on the internet using commonly used websites like Google has been found to be very popular and effective. Google is one of the most commonly used search engines in the world. The most important marketing strategy that is used by Google is that it is free. Hence, it makes Google an ideal platform for advertising of one's product and services. This is because since the website is free, it is used by a large number of people. It is attracted by a large number of people from all over the world, which in turn provides a global platform for advertising of the products and services that one has to sell. Now, apart from advertising using these popular sites, nowadays social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, YouTube are also used for advertisement of products. YouTube is another popular online platform where digital advertising is extensively used. As per the reports, YouTube has more than 2 billion active users worldwide and these users spend few hours of their time daily on watching the videos. 
this makes YouTube another popular platform for digital advertising. Facebook is yet another popular platform for digital marketing and advertising. More than 1.5 billion users visit Facebook daily which gives it a huge consumer base. Also, using Facebook ads, one can tailor the advertisements of their product or the services they wish to offer towards a specific audience based on their gender, based on their age, based on the location, based on their job and based on interested fields. All of which of these details are shared by the users on their Facebook profiles. So for example, if we have a service uh, or if you have a good that we want to sell to a only women, then we can use this targeted Facebook ads campaign to target only women over a specific reason. Another popular digital marketing social media platform is Instagram. Instagram has over 1 billion active users monthly. Instagram has features like brand strengthening and improved engagement which helps it to be a preferred social media platform for both the sellers and the consumer in today's world. So these were the different types of uh, social media platforms and digital platforms that can be used for marketing our goods and services using computers and the internet in the digital age. Now let us look at how teaching has changed in the digital age. Teachers, instructors, faculty and students are facing unprecedented change due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. While before the pandemic, the online mode of teaching and learning was a matter of choice for both the parties, whether it be students or teachers. During the pandemic, the online mode of teaching and learning has become a necessity for both the students and the teachers. The conventional mode of teaching using classroom teaching could not be carried out during the pandemic and the lockdown situations. And so, the teaching had to be shifted to the digital mode. And this was for all the levels of education. This can be seen in the school level education, the college level education, and even in case of the university level education. The internet has been a huge facilitator along with the different tools and techniques that are available on the internet to aid the teachers and the students in conducting these online classes so that there is no disruption in the teaching learning process during the pandemic. During the pandemic, it had been seen that social media platforms like Facebook had been used for live classes, uh, social media platforms like WhatsApp and Telegram had been used for creating specific student-specific groups and also for conducting of online classes. Now let us look at some of the technologies that were used for teaching. The first one is a video conferencing platform called Zoom. Zoom was developed by Zoom Video Communications and it has been always used as a popular web conferencing platform. We for multinational and IT companies. The free plan of Zoom allows up to 100 concurrent participants and a 40 minute time restrictions, which is very convenient for teachers to organize online classes. Hence, Zoom was used by the teachers for conduct of online classes during the pandemic. Another popular video communication service that was used by teachers and students during the pandemic is Google Meet. Google Meet is also a video communication service and it has been developed by Google. The free plan of Google Meet also allows up to 100 participants. Google also offers special features in its enterprise edition of G Suite for education which is especially for educational institutions with class recording facilities. Hence, Google Meet was also used by teachers and students for teaching or for online teaching and learning in the pandemic. Another technology that we have seen that has been used in the pandemic is the use of learning management system or LMS. 
let us look at some of the popular LMS that has been used by both teachers and students for teaching learning in this pandemic. And the first one is Google Classroom. Google Classroom is a learning management system or LMS that is very popular since it is easy to use and it helps in easier communication between the teacher and the students. Google Classroom integrates a variety of other Google applications for education such as Google Docs, Google Sheets, Google Slides, Gmail and Google Calendar into a cohesive platform to manage the student and teacher communication. Another popular learning management system that has been used is Moodle. The popularity of Moodle can be seen since it is free and open source and hence it can be modified by the teachers or the educational institutions as by the requirement of their learners. The Moodle platform allows teachers to offer their courses in a safe, accessible and engaging environment. Hence, we can see that both of these learning management platforms, be it by Google Classroom or Moodle or any other learning management system are used or have been used in the pandemic. So learners, we have come to the end of this video lecture. So in this module, we have learned about the meaning of the term computer literacy. So we now know what is computer literacy. We have also learned about the major components of a computer, be it input devices, output devices, central processing unit, or be the computer memory. We have been also made familiar with the different types of input and output devices that we see in our day-to-day -day life. We have also learned about the different technologies that can be used by us to get our connections to the internet. We have also learned what is the meaning of the term digital marketing and how digital marketing and using social media platforms like YouTube, Facebook, Instagram can be used to advertise the goods and services that have to be offered. We have also learned how different teleconferencing applications like Zoom and Google Meet and different learning management systems like Moodle and Google Classroom can be used in the teaching learning process. So now we have come to the end of this lecture. Thank you for watching.